and welcome everybody online and in person. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down and kneel before the Lord, our maker. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day and for bringing us together in community to learn of you and to be joined together with your goodwill. Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, as in heaven, so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debt, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So we're going to continue on with the uh, Luke story, and this is the only story we have of the Lord when he was a child, not an infant or a baby, but a child. It's a well-known story. It's from Luke 2, 39 through 52. So when they had performed all these things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong in spirit with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. When they had finished the days as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother did not know it, but supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. So when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. Now, so it was that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. So when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have been looking for you anxiously. And he said to them, why did you look for me? Don't you know that I must be in that which is of my father? but they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. But his mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and people. Amen. So this is a really precious story because it's the one window in the New Testament where we get to see Jesus's childhood. And it's an amazing story. But we are very blessed in that in the Arcana Celestia or Secrets of Heaven, we get to see a great deal about the Lord in his child and infancy about what was happening in the transformation of his mind, going from predominantly human in his thinking and his willing to uh, fully divine. Now, there are some, including uh, a, a friend of mine who is a very devout, uh, pastor in the convention named Gard Perry, who says this has to be talking about the infancy and childhood of his spiritual life. And so it may be, but regardless, it's a really wonderful passage. And it starts in the interpretation of Abraham and continues on through uh, Genesis. And basically, I'll summarize the 
the progress that we're talking about. In fact, this part in the Arcana actually talks about this story. It references this story right at the beginning of when it starts to talk about him. So the progress that it talks about is that first, the Lord received what are called remnants or remains, and these are hidden away, beautiful, unconscious memories, uh, and they're not so much cognitive memories, but they're memories of the heart, we could say, of innocence and awe and love. And because the Lord's Father was Jehovah, these were perfect in him. They were full and complete, unlike we get to have. And then the next step is that he began to learn knowledge from the word. He studied the word, obviously, from this story we learned that. And these uh, knowledges from the word, though, were not enough. God's love had to flow in and make them alive. And I'm going to read to you a few passages from this series in the Arcana. So starting at 1450 and then moving up until 1475. Don't worry, I'm not reading it all the way through. Just selections from that. Uh, Since the Lord was born as any other is born, he too was introduced according to order into heavenly things of love and as remnants, step by step from infancy on into childhood, and after that into knowledge. That Abraham traveled, going out and traveling, represented the beginning of the Lord's journey towards knowledge, uh, that the Lord also was taught like any other child is made clear in Luke, and that's when it references our story. Continuing, Abraham went down into Egypt to reside as a foreigner means being taught concepts from the word. The passage in Luke regarding Jesus in the temple as a boy, makes it clear that while he was young, the Lord was taught like any other person. The outer self cannot be reduced into correspondence and agreement with the inner self except through knowledge. One's outer self is body-centered and sense-oriented, and it cannot absorb God's love. And then it goes on to say that Truth from the word, however, knowledge from the word, are like seeds. And our mundane mind, which cannot know God, uh, is like the soil. The soil can't grow, but we can put seeds into that soil of our mind. Seeds from the word, these are truths. And then, like the sun shining down onto the seeds, God's love can make those start to grow and vivify our mind. The lower plane of knowledge and thought, knowing truth, knowing knowledge of truth, even deep spiritual knowledge is not alive. We can know the Third Testament in and out. We can know the Old and New Testament in and out. But these things are are dead knowledge until God's love starts to animate them. We read this in this same series. It is one thing to be in heavenly things and another to be in the knowledge of heavenly things. And it even goes on to say in this same series that mere knowledge alone from our the lower plane of our thinking that is sense oriented, this actually wants nothing more than to reach up and try to know deeper things but that because it's coming from a place of self, it will do violence to those things. Can't help but do violence to those things. Can anyone here think of why that might be? What is the kind of violence that we might be talking about? How does our selfishness grabbing onto the word start to do violence? Yeah, that's a great one. And it's easy for all of us who who really love the word and search and we find things that we love and we think that is great. I got to tell other people it starts out as good, but then it can easily end up. No, you're wrong. I'm right. And that's violence. We're doing violence. 
and it can puff up our pride, right? That's another kind of violence because the word is supposed to be doing the exact opposite of those things, isn't it? It's meant to be promoting love and congeniality and it's supposed to be teaching us humility so that we can enter into relationships of love. Love's eye is the only true vision. It's the only thing that can see truth in the word and how to see other people into how to see the universe. It's love's eye. And everyone's eye will see things a little bit different. And that's beautiful. And that's the way it should be. So I was wondering if my volunteers could come up. Hey, Jeff, check this out. I have these really cool things. And I've they're called Legos, and I've organized them according to color. This is the way they're supposed to be organized. I don't know who put that one over there. That is wrong. <clears throat> I don't know. Organized by size. What are you talking about? You are wrong. These have to be organized. Hey, we're having a discussion here. Yeah, I just wanted to show you this really cool thing. Nah, no, 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 no. You you can't mess around. This is this is sacred. You can't do stuff with it. <laughs> Don't touch. You shouldn't be touching. What is that? That doesn't even belong there. The thing that's cool about this is that they help people. What? Like if someone needs to go somewhere, they can get in and get a ride. I mean, wait a minute, but I agree with Jeff. This one's different. Mm -hmm. These are all vehicles. Fine. You want to make some vehicles, but this one's different. Look, this is, they, um, these ones, they have little books that tell you how to do it. They give instructions. But this one, in a way, it's even, in a way, it's even more special because um, it came out of somebody's imagination. It came out of Evan's imagination, actually. Ah, oh, wait a minute. You... This is useful too because people might need a place to live. The person might want to live there, or maybe this one. Now, nah, wait a minute. That person. That one doesn't even belong there. Yeah, that's not the right kind of person. We can't use that one. We're not allowed to help that kind of person. This is a rescue helicopter, and it can rescue everybody. Nah. Also. If it's if it's not from the instructions, then we're not supposed to build it. It's not right. But the things that we make out of love and imagination from these tools are really special, and they can help people too. They can be useful too. Like this person could live in this house. Oh wait a minute! That's a man with a wig. It's -Man. We're not allowed to help that kind of person. <laughs> Uh, but these these are instructions from the creator. I don't see this in there. I don't know if that's okay. I'll have to think about that one. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but you know what? The more I think about it, Mandy, I think you might be right. I think you might be right. So thank you for enlightening me. <clears throat> So obviously, this represents knowledge, and we can get so attached to knowledge and our way of organizing it that we start to miss the point. The point is, of course, to understand it in certain ways, right? We think we understand it correctly, but really, unless it's coming from love, how do we serve people? How do we make this serve people to the, from what it's saying in the instructions? then we're missing the point. So then we think, okay, now I got it. I got the instructions. We're meant to serve and we make things and we say, this is cool. We're actually helping people. And then, wait a minute, not everyone is, no, we help everybody, right? Everyone is our neighbor. And if we are rearranging things, if we are seeing things in a way that's different than other people, in a way that's different from 
what other people say is written there. As long as we are approaching it from love to the best of our ability, knowing that that love's from God, it's okay. It is okay. The Lord says that those who are taught will take from treasures from what has already been there, and they will also take from new treasures that they come up with. Those who are perfectly taught will, will provide things from old storehouses and new storehouses. And I believe that that means every person has a new insight into the word. And if they are trained in love, that's great. That's great. And we should celebrate that. I have one more thing. And uh, so a person's looking at this and the other people, wow, look at the beautiful, intricate carvings. This is amazing. This is beautiful. This is perfect. And we can admire those things. But then someone else says, hey, did you guys know that this is a horse? Oh, yeah, we knew that. It's obvious. We, we could tell. Yeah, but did you know that you can assemble it into a horse? Yeah, no, no, you don't touch it. You can't touch it. You leave it. It's holy. This is the way it was. This is the way it has to be. No, 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 no. You can create a horse out of this. Come on, let's go for it. And then you make the horse and you think, now it's wonderful. How wonderful this horse. And then the person says, well, it's even more wonderful than you know, because it's not really the horse that counts. It's the happy, joyful people that the horse serves. And this horse did serve And what, I love this picture. That's Evan and Avia. And that's what the word is for. It's to make people happy. And that's what we're meant to read it for, to make people happy. And that's what this story is all about, right? So we can see Mary and Joseph, who are trying to be in control of the Lord, as our understanding before it's received God's love. They're doing the best they can, and we do the best we can. We're trying to understand the word, but we're doing it from a belief that we are organizing it. We are the ones who are doing things. No, it's God's love that works in our mind, that makes those seeds grow. We can't make seeds grow. Only the Lord's love makes that grow. And that's Mary and Joseph, and they're learning. They're learning. Eventually, even, even Mary will come to worship the Lord and say, this is not really my son. This is God. And that's talking about a major transition when we come to realize my life is not my own. My thoughts are not my own. The love in my heart is not my own. Those are God's gifts inside of me. And the scribes and Pharisees are amazed. At this point, we don't hear any belligerence against it, but eventually there is those same scribes and Pharisees are beginning to get into a major conflict with the Lord. And they will promote the crucifixion of the Lord. And there is something inside of us that does not want to let go of our own understanding of the word that it is right or that my life is the best way to think. You know, my thinking is the best way of thinking. And I have to convince everyone else that that is the right way to think. And that my life is my own. And I'm proud of all the knowledge I have from the word. That's what the scribes and Pharisees learn. Now think about it. It's, it talks about the same story in TCR. And I just wanna read you this one quote, it says, uh, the Lord's life followed the path of every other person's life on earth because that is the divine design for people to prepare themselves to accept God, and the Lord had to follow that same path. And as they prepare themselves, God enters them as if he were coming into his own dwelling and his own home. And that's what, again, the temple is a representation of the Lord's home in us, right? So remember those knowledges from the word, they are that temple, right? 
And then the Lord can come in with his love. And we see that in this story too. But the Lord also says, when the disciples were looking at that temple later on, and they were like, wow, look how amazing this temple is. Look at these stones. And the Lord says, every single one of these stones is going to fall down. It will be destroyed. That's hard for us to hear. What is that talking about? That means we will have to come to a major spiritual crisis where our understanding of God and reality and others and ourselves will have to crumble apart. It has to go through that process. But the Lord will rebuild it. Right? He will rise again. Now, both the TCR and the Arcana Celestia that I was reading talks about becoming one. So in um, 1461 from Arcana, it says that the knowledge is, the Lord only willed to be, uh, to receive knowledge from the word because he realized that that's the Lord, that the word is the Lord and it gave him access to the Lord. And uh, which again says, gave him open access to the Father, Jehovah himself, with whom he was to unite and become one, become one. And then in the TCR, it says the same number that I was reading from about this story. It says, it is a divine law of order that the closer and closer a person comes to God, which a person must do wholly as if by themselves, the closer and closer God comes and deep within the person unites himself to the person and the Lord advanced to complete union with his father according to that order. So this story is about the beginning of the Lord's union with God himself until they were one and our progress towards union with the Lord. And the Lord does come into us and we do have a communion, communion. That's service that we hold is all about that. Becoming, having our will become of the Lord's will. That's a beautiful, beautiful teaching. And one of my very favorite numbers from the Third Testament, Arcana Celestia 10, uh, 1013, talks about this union. And it says, this oneness is a mystical union. This is oneness with God that some people contemplate a union achieved only through, you guessed it, love. And it talks about the Lord's Prayer in John 17, where the whole chapter is him praying for oneness, oneness with us as he is one with his Father. Very, very beautiful things. Okay, so a uh, question is, how do we help this process get along? How do we? And one thing is to read and meditate on the word, not just read the word, meditate on the word. What does that do, meditating? It quiet downs, it quiets down our own will. And you might say, well, that's cheating. We have to overcome our own will other ways. But it's a choice. We're making a choice. I'm going to submit my will at this point. To what? To nothing. I'm going to make it quiet. And then once we have that plane of consciousness that Don has talked about, we bring in thoughts of the word, and we will see new things there in that state. Meditation has been shown to amplify empathy and to amplify um, a sense of spirit and oneness. And these are the things that the Lord wants for us. And if we get to that, a higher plane of thought, then we bring in the word, it can be very wonderful. Um, and another thing is, touching on what you were saying, Nancy, is devotion, adoration, and gratitude to the Lord. Because these things also push down that ego, right? Really loving and honoring God, the Lord, as our maker, as our savior, as our provider, and everything else. 
So those are some things that we can do. And I encourage you to try these things and to make them a practice, to take time to just submit ourselves to God in adoration and worship in true humility, and also to meditate on the word. Uh, I told you about that number about mystical oneness. I want to read to you the very end. It says, this union that makes us likeness and images is not of the Lord, is not as clear to see in the human race as it is in heaven. Oh, oh sorry, that's not the, the right part. Okay, so it says, love is what binds together and that the Lord has a home in those who love him and who love the neighbor, since loving our neighbor is loving the Lord. Loving the neighbor is loving the Lord, and that's what brings us into oneness with him. So when we read the word and we bow to the Lord and we meditate and we read the word, then we should always remember that this is all so that we can love the neighbor because that's how the Lord wants us to love him because that's where he needs to be loved. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.